Thank you very much. I'm Vahag Nikolian, excited to present from Portland, Oregon. Uh, so disclosures, uh, I'm a consultant for Care Syntax, Intuitive Surgical and Medtronic, though these are not relevant to today's presentation. So it's not just a hernia. Many of us in our clinics see patients of this nature. They come in, they need advanced abdominal wall reconstruction. When you talk to these patients, oftentimes the index operation on their ab wall was actually a straightforward or seemingly straightforward umbilical hernia repair. So how do we avoid that? In a perfect world, we can pair the right patient with the right operation and the right timing and have our best outcome. Unfortunately, these variables are often out of our control and we have to deal with some very complex situations. So today, we're gonna to talk about how we define uh, risk factors and how we can use data to improve our management of high-risk scenarios. We'll also review strategies to mitigate risk and improve outcome. So let's start with assessing patient risk factors. A lot of work's been done by the Ventral Hernia Work Group uh, looking at how we can grade preoperative risk. When you focus on comorbidity status, you see diabetes, COPD, immunosuppression, uh, active smoking and obesity, common, common themes and common sort of focuses for prehab programs. A lot of people wonder, should we optimize patients who are coming in with a primary umbilical hernia? I say, why not? Um, the bottom line is your best shot at repairing a hernia is your first time, and so you should work towards trying to break the cycle of recurrence. When we're talking about obesity, smoking, and diabetes, we define some goals. It's not absolute numbers, it's more about trajectory. So working with your patient, getting them closer to these metrics can improve your outcome long term. Every time I think about umbilical hernias or my residents are asking what should I read, I refer to this paper. It's very good. It reviews thousands of uh, publications and distills it down to what we know and what opportunities we have to learn. So let's talk about assessing risk, anatomic considerations. So they're small, medium, and large. Um, but beyond that, you wanna use your clinical exam and judgment. Um, oftentimes, primary umbilicals are not gonna necess necessitate imaging, but you wanna be thoughtful about it, especially in high-risk populations. If your diagnosis is in doubt, if you're wondering what, how large the defect is, you may wanna get some imaging studies. If the patient's had prime, prior operations and there might be occult hernias that can impact your repair. If the patient has a diastasis, as we heard about, it can impact your outcome. And then in cirrhotic patients in particular, I like to get imaging. I want to know if there's any evidence of recanalized umbilical vessels, which can make your operation much more dangerous. Imaging doesn't just give us a road map. It can also help assess the risk of observing hernias. So primary umbilicals, a lot of patients are told, watch for waiting, don't worry about it. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily true for some. So hernia morphology matters. Hernia neck ratio is a nice number to use and keep in the back of your head. If the diameter of the hernia sac is 2.5 times greater than the diameter of the hernia diam or neck, you're looking at a high-risk hernia. You should not be recommending non-operative management, and you should recommend working towards a plan for repair. So let's look at some common high-risk patient populations that present to our clinics and in our clinical setting. Cirrhosis, morbid obesity, women desiring future pregnancy, emergent, urgent operations. Of course, we know that these are gonna be associated with higher risk. We heard a great talk about concurrent diastasis, so I'll leave that out of this discussion. So let's talk about cirrhosis. Every time a cirrhotic patient needs an operation, we're worried. Are we gonna push them into a setting of decompensation? Are we gonna risk morbidity, mortality? And it's not just you know my squeamish hernia vibes going at it. A lot of uh, uh, hepatobiliary surgeons also worry. So this is a study out of, uh, in 2009. They asked hepatobiliary surgeons what they perceived the complication burden to be for umbilical hernia repair in a cirrhotic patient. And here's what they thought. Clearly, every patient has high risk for morbidity and mortality. And even class A cirrhotics have a 14 or 4% morbidity and mortality rate, respectively. So these are perceptions. What's the reality? Reality is it's actually not as bad as we think. Morbidity and mortality for class A and B cirrhotics is 16% and 0% respectively in many studies. And this isn't that different from patients without cirrhosis. Class C, of course, some of the sickest patients in the hospital. If you're doing hernia repairs on these patients, very high risk. But it's important to know that our perceptions and realities in this setting differ. 
Cirrhotic patients, in reality, we've gotten a lot better about taking care of them. Over the last few decades, our mortality rates have gone into the single digits, and in many series for class A and B have gone down to zero. So fix it when you can. It's a great paper out of Texas. They looked at this. Emergency surgery for cirrhotic patients for umbilical hernias was associated with mortality. If you take care of these patients in the elective setting, you reduce their risk for mortality by 64%. So it's true. Umbilical hernia can be a life-saving intervention. Morbid obesity. We know the data. Patients with morbid obesity are going to have higher rates of SSI, are going to have higher rates of hernia recurrence, increased pulmonary complication, blood clots, you name it. So many of us provide MIS approaches for these patients in efforts to reduce wound morbidity and complication profile. Let's say you're sitting in the audience. You're like, I like to take care of these patients with an open umbilical hernia repair. Are you doing a disservice? Should you be sending them to an MIS surgeon? The answer is, you're probably doing a good job. And ACHQC looked at this retrospectively, 30-day outcomes for SSIs, SSOPI, also for recurrence at one, two, and three years. And essentially, MIS and open for these patients, the BMI cutoff was 30, is about the same. No statistically significant difference. Clearly, not the best outcomes. I don't think anyone would really be happy with the recurrence rates that we're seeing on the board here. But the bottom line is, you can provide either, whichever you're comfortable with. Concurrent bariatric surgery and hernia repair. A lot of people wonder, can I do it? Is it safe? And some decent data out of the NISQIP looking at this. And the bottom line is, it's not as safe as just bariatric only, but it's not that dangerous either. So if you want to do it, have that thoughtful conversation with your patient in advance of the operation. Make sure that your team is aware that there's going to be a higher rate of reoperations or readmissions. And as long as you're all on the same page, you can take care of these patients well. Pregnancy and women of childbearing age is another group that I put into a bucket of higher risk. And here's why. So if you see a patient, they oftentimes will develop a hernia after their um, pregnancy. They want to have that hernia repaired. You really have to ask the questions, are you planning another pregnancy? And if the answer is yes, then you really have to assess how, what their symptomatology is. If they're asymptomatic and just bothered by the cosmesis, it may be better to do a watchful waiting approach. Any repair strategy, whether it's open, suture-based, mesh-based, is going to have a 1.6 to 1.8-fold increased rate of recurrence. So you want to be careful with what you're offering. And more importantly, using mesh for these patients, if they have a future pregnancy, five-fold increased risk for developing chronic pain during their future pregnancy. So you don't want to be too aggressive too early on these patients and take your time, give them sort of an understanding of what they're dealing with. Emergency hernia surgery, of course, very high risk. Um, but it's important to restructure our prioritization for these patients. So first and foremost, assess and preserve bioviability. That's the goal of the operation. Secondary goals, provide safe hernia repair. And then third, maintain options for future repair. Uh, a group of emergency surgeons met in 2017 and looked at this data. We know 15-fold increase in mortality, reoperation, and reoccurrence when you're doing an emergency hernia repair. That's why you don't want to burn any of these bridges for future reconstruction. Is mesh safe in the emergency setting? By and large, it is for clean and clean contaminated cases, and probably safe for the contaminated cases as well. The bottom line is location, location, location. That's what matters with mesh. Not every plane of the abdominal wall is going to have the same ability to withstand an infectious process, but you want to be careful. So options for emergency settings. I love this paper. It proves uh, or it shows what many of us believe to be true, which is that retromuscular repairs, which have become so popular over the last decade or so, uh, may not be a good option in the emergency setting with a tenfold increased rate of re-intervention. So just be careful who you're doing these retrorectus repairs on in the emergency setting. So let's talk about determining the best operation. Right now, if I flip the podium, I start talking about a three centimeter umbilical hernia and give you some other factors for the patients. I bet I could find someone who could justify any one of these approaches. We have a ton of options available to us for what we call a simple umbilical hernia at this point. So it's on us as surgeons to cater the options to what the patient desires and what you can provide to the best of your abilities. 
Of course, I lost my mouse. We almost got through it. All right. Can someone advance the slide? All right, quality of evidence. This is good news. Everything we just talked about, everything in this session, essentially had very poor quality of evidence to support what we just said. <laughs> the strength of the recommendations are weak, which means that there's tons of opportunity for research. So if you're interested in trying to make things better, even umbilical hernia, one of the oldest problems that general surgeons have dealt with, have opportunities for improvement. Next slide. All right, so umbilical hernias in complex patients are not simple. Simple solutions to complex uh, problems will simply fail, and simple solutions or complex solutions to simple problems are going to fail poorly. So be careful with the options that you choose. All right, next slide. You can run through these relatively quickly. These are my general thoughts on how to manage them. Go, go, go. Uh, I'm excited to talk about how we manage these scenarios in our discussion. All right. Thank you.